turn on the panel if if, if they could um, turn on their cameras um, and come and join us and we'll we'll begin the discussion. Um, Tevik, I'm going to ask you a question to begin with. Um, so we're, we're diagnosing more and more hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in patients that don't necessarily have a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And whenever we do genetic testing, we don't find a sarcomeric variant on genetic testing. And, and we give them lots of labels like non-familial HCM or sarcomeric negative HCM. Should we be managing these patients and their families in a different way to patients with familial or typical sarcomeric HCM? Oh, we, we can't hear you at the moment, Tarek. No, we, we can't hear you now. Maybe while you're working out your microphone, wh why don't we ask the same question to Antonis? Well, it depends what you mean by management and which part of the disease you're managing. So if you're managing, for example, the obstruction, maybe there's not much difference. And uh, even with drugs, even with drugs coming out in the near future, we are not sure whether they will be different in uh, genetically positive, genetically negative patients, although maybe they will be, but we don't know yet. But if it comes to the natural history, this may be different indeed, because um, what may be um, sarcomeric HCM and more particularly um, um, related to specific genes and specific mutations may have a different prognosis uh, than what is non-sarcomeric and so on. Therefore, in-depth and detailed diagnosis and understanding of the cause of the condition is important because, well, I'm looking at OS now, it, it clearly has uh, consequences also uh, in relation to the long term prognosis, transplant, this and that, and escalation of management, and so on. Super. And uh, so, uh, another quick question that Tevik and us answer this as you, as you wish. Should we manage their family differently? Should we screen their families in different ways? I'm afraid we still can't hear you, Tevik. Sorry. So um, how will you know that it is not running in the family if you don't screen the family? So you have to screen, you have to screen the family first and, and then you will find out whether it's there or not. Now, uh, whether you will be continue, will continue screening the family or not, this is not a simple question or is not a simple answer. I suppose it's a simple question, but it's a complex answer because this does not only depend on what you may expect from the condition itself, but also on the healthcare um, resources and what you can really offer to the patients. I saw very quickly an, an, a question earlier about DCM. I think it was how much can we screen the families for this and that. And that applies here as well. If you have a hypertrophic empathy uh, phenotype, which is not likely to present in the family, maybe is what we call uh, um, uh, old person's heart uh, with uh, minimal hypertrophy at an older age and so on, and you don't expect to see it in the family, Maybe you don't start from an early age and keep screening these people, but you only do it when you think it's of some relevance. Having sure. said that, you have to make sure that you, uh, you're not missing something in the family, at least at the beginning of the diagnosis. Great. Mighty. No, I, I just wanted to, what it seems to be emerging at the moment, and we are only at the beginning of this emerging amount of information, is the ability by doing more genetic testing in the uh, in the index individual, the one who has got the the clearer phenotype, the possibility of identifying what the concept of family clustering. So there will be a group of individuals within the family that will have a similar genetic background, but perhaps not the monogenic disorder 50-50 inheritance. And that might be very difficult to differentiate within siblings, might be easier to differentiate within the next generation. So we are actually going to start practicing uh, managing those concepts, but in order to do the homework, the homework is to screen the family first. And then and we need to understand that some, you never know, you don't have the choice to see who is the person you have in front of you, the one with the milder phenotype, 
or the one with the worst phenotype because symptoms sometimes don't help you to know which one is the one who has got the most severe. So I'm afraid that doing the homework of uh, uh, understanding the family is not going to go away. Do you think polygenic risk scores will help us understand those types of I think I, I think that they are promising, but like all these things, you know, I haven't been doing that now over 20 years, you know, I will not put my hand in the fire yet, you know, yeah. so they seem to be really interesting concept, but I'm not jumping to the wagon yet. Super. Yeah. Ooh, like. Paz, hand up as well there. Paz, um, did you want to comment as well? Yeah, just about the sarcomeric negative HCM um, and whether we differ in our management. I think one thing to really bring out is we need to be really aggressive in risk factor management with these um, patients, particularly regarding blood pressure. And there's some really neat work published from Hugh Watkins's group um, and HCMG West that, that appeared in Nature Genetics last year, showing the, the interaction between common genetic variants for this sarcomeric negative group and diastolic blood pressure um, was much more marked than those without these common variants and with and compared to the, the sarcomeric positive HCMs. So essentially don't forget the basics in, in these. So they may not have too much variance, but be really aggressive with blood pressure management as it does have an impact for this population. And what blood pressure should we be aiming for in these patients, Pat? Brian, you know very well that <laughs> we don't have any clear targets for these. And um, what is interesting, however, is that the diastolic is important. So really don't just target the systolic, um, aim for lowering diastolic as well. Super, Antonis. Just a quick comment. I, I agree with everything that has been said, but I want to make the distinction between scientific observations and clinical practice. And for the as for the scientific observations, I agree with Paz, yes. But as for the clinical practice, I need to go back to what Mighty said, and I think I said also before, that it's a bit too early to take all these things uh, on board clinically, because uh, we, we may have a, a huge burden on the healthcare system without enough evidence that they actually make a difference. Thank you very much. Um, that kind of brings us on to one of our other questions um, kind of for the panel, but targeted more for um, Gavardo and Paz in relation to can we use genetic testing to guide management in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy? Um, and can it change actually how we risk stratify these patients? I don't know who wants to start. Um, to go first. I can jump in about DCM. So this is a really great question because with DCM in particular, the devil is in the detail. So there is no such thing, in my opinion, as genetic DCM. Um, and if we loop genetic DCM altogether, you'll miss things. And really what's driving, so the risk of somebody with a titan truncating genetic variant and somebody with a lamin genetic variant with dilated cardiomyopathy is very different. And so it's really important to look beneath that and, and to risk stratify, certainly based on the gene, but we may get to a stage where we risk stratify even based on hotspots within a gene or variants. And But we're, we're definitely not at that stage at the moment. So yes, at the moment, we know that there are particular genetic variants such as lamin, such as the, the desensomal variants, for example, that confer a higher risk of arrhythmias. We don't have any good, we don't have any RCT evidence of what to do about that. At the moment, everything's based on observational data that if you have a lamin variant, for example, and a, uh, an indication for pacemaker, then we should put in an ICD. Um, but we really need some robust RCT data to support that practice. Go right ahead. And uh, I would agree uh, with with you, Paz. Uh, I think I think it's it's really an important question. We don't have an answer from. Uh, randomized controlled trial or even from like long longitudinal um, longitudinal studies, observational studies. But uh, for sure, I think that uh, especially in the in the field of dilated cardiomyopathy, but also of, of aromogenic cardiomyopathy, if we have a phenotype of a dilated heart and uh, with systolic dysfunction, having, for example, a desmosoma mutation would change our clinical practice is this a question and I think it would change our clinical practice having the knowledge of um, the patient having a desmosoma mutation will make us a, li a little bit more cautious a little bit more wary maybe we will follow the patient uh, more closely with uh, more halter monitor exercise tests because we know that uh, 
uh, it, it may confer an additional risk, especially in terms of arrhythmias. So, so I think it, would, it changes our clinical so, practice. But yeah, we don't have we don't have long term studies. Super, thanks very much. And a quick question for for uh, Gerardo on on arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So we're using the label more and more. In the past, we used to use it only for patients with presumed desmosomal disease, and, and now people recently have proposed that we could apply even patients with Titan associated DCM, Lamin, Filament C. What should we, um, you know, who should we refer to? People with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy should it be defined on arrhythmia? Should it be defined on suspicion of desmosomal disease? Um, yes. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's a very topical and complicated question. I don't have an answer. I can tell you what I think. Uh, I think that uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is a vague term. And uh, of course, uh, you know, it may collect many different type of patients that, that uh, just have the, the common feature of, of having arrhythmias and having a cardiomyopathy. So, I mean, I think I think it's really difficult. I mean, at the end of the day, we use terminology, we use classifications to to help ourselves. But uh, uh, I think we are in a moment in time where maybe terminology and classification may make us a little bit more confused. Uh, I don't know. I think that maybe the the term inherited arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy may be helpful, uh, but also that would collect many different type of patients. Uh, and, and maybe even more confusing. So uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to this question. Thank you very much. And uh, just for our, um, uh, Mighty actually has a, a question for you in regards to um, your views on uh, transplant um, for females um, and pregnancy uh, and post-transplant. Uh, what are your views on, uh, on that? Sorry, uh, that was a, that was a question for you. Always did did, did you did you get us? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I thought it wasn't addressed to me. Um, yeah, no, I think um, you know, pulmonary hypertension and uh, uh, so post transplant. We're talking about post transplant pregnancy. I think it's difficult because one, there's the issue about. In genetically inheriting the original cardiac condition. So they need to be appropriately counseled. A lot of the immune suppressants are teratogenic, so need to be held. And as a result, the risk of rejection increases. So it's a really, really precarious thing. It has been done. People, we've got several uh, young women recently who've been, become pregnant and have, have had successful pregnancies. Um, but I, I, would, I generally tend to encourage them to steer away from it and look at alternative uh, sort of avenues, adoption and fostering that sort of stuff. Um, we there, there are sort of pregnancy, cardio, uh, pregnancy and heart disease clinics that we refer them to and they get appropriately counseled. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I generally tend to shy away from it if I can. I advise them to get away from that. So another so final question for you, Ois. So, um, so thing you know, so cardiomyopathies with neuromuscular manifestations, um, <clears throat> mitochondrial disorders, or or, or or other type of neuromuscular um, syndromes. When when do they become contraindications in terms of transplant, and which patients should we be referring to you? Um, that's a great question. Um, we recently had somebody who dis was discharged um, last week with a mitochondrial myopathy, um, so the whole full bone spectrum. Um, but he he was somebody that his pre-morbid state was relatively good. He was able to walk, albeit very slowly, and was a bit frail. But we, we he went through a comprehensive physio assessment, and it was all felt that he could get through and rehab post post operatively to a state where he could have a good quality of life. So I think that's critical, and I think the underlying myopathy we from the neuromuscular team need to have uh, a, an expert view that their long term survival is going to be good. I mean, when I say long term, I think that five year survival is is going to be relatively good. Super. Well, thanks very much, everyone. Um, so we will call it end to the end of the first session. We'll take a 10 minute break and we will come back at 3.30 for uh, the next set of talks and then the final MDT panel discussion, uh, which will probably take place at about half past four. So we're run about 10 minutes late, but hopefully we'll make up a little bit of time 
um, at, at the next session. So thanks to all of the speakers um, and thanks for, for contributing to the panel discussion. All very interesting talks. Thanks. <laughs>